OK, um, so good evening, everybody. Good evening, councillors, members of the public, officers. Um, I'm David Stevens. I'm the Mayor of Reading and I'll be chairing the council this evening. Um, firstly, welcome you all to the meeting of the council, which is held as an online meeting again with social distancing rules still in force. Councillors um, are meeting tonight on this video conferencing platform instead of meeting in person at the Civic Centre. As it's only the second meeting of the full council since the Coronavirus Act 2020 has allowed local authority committees to be conducted online, um, attending remotely by officers and members, I'll now go for the procedure to be followed. Although the meeting is still being held online, the public and the press can still see and hear the meeting. Um, the agenda papers have been published on the council's website and the modern, modern, ah, sorry, the modern government app, and these papers are being considered by members this evening. Um, as usual, if you want to speak on an item this evening and have not informed in advance, please could you indicate in the chat section that you wish to do so. Um, the officers and I will be monitoring the chat and you'll be called to speak or being well in the order in which you indicate your intentions. Could I ask you also please just to limit your use of the chat to matters which relate to the business of tonight's agenda so it makes it easier for, for the three of us to actually uh, monitor and call you to speak at the correct time. Similar to the previous meeting in October last year, I'm again proposing with Council's permission to seek general consent for the motions before us this evening um, to avoid lengthy roll calls of all councillors if we possibly can. However, in the event that any, are there any different voting intentions for political groups, I'll allow time for individual councillors to ask for their votes to be recorded or to state how they would have voted if they so wish. If there's, if there's any dissent to the proposal, I'll undertake a full roll call of all councillors present. Naturally, this proposal does not affect the right of any three councillors to demand that any vote be recorded in accordance with Council Procedure Rule 24 brackets 1. Um, if in this instance, a full roll call of councillors will be necessary. I'll shortly ask members to introduce themselves um, for the benefit of the public and also to assure that all their attendances are expected and they can hear and speak during the meeting. Can I remind officers and members, please, to put their microphones on mute when you're not speaking, but when you are called to speak, you should unmute your microphones and pause for about three seconds to allow for a slight time delay in connection. Almost remember to also to put your camera on short before being called to speak, otherwise you will not be visible um, on the screen as when you start your contribution. If you don't put your com camera on, you will not be visible throughout your speech. As ever at the mercy of individuals, broadband services, and if it's possible that loss of connection might happen, however, as long as we may have 12 members present, we can carry on with a meeting as being court. I now go to a roll call of councillors. And um, please, if you just anticipate your name, you know where you are on the list. Um, could you introduce yourselves to the meeting? Um, councillors, please state your name and any position you hold. So I'm Councillor David Stevens. As mayor, one of my responsibilities is to chair these council meetings. I'll now call on all other members of the council alphabetically. When I say your name, please say yes to confirm you're present. Off we go. Councillor David Absalom. Yes, Mayor. Councillor Debs Absalom. Yes, Mayor. <laughs> Councillor yes. Ayob. Yes, Mr Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Ballsden. Yes, Mayor. Um, Councillor Barnett Ward. Yes, present. Yep. Councillor Brock. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Paul Carmel. Uh, yes, Mayor. Councillor Challenger. Yes, Mayor. Councillor Davies. Yes, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Devine. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councillor <coughs> Eden. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Edwards. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Councillor Emerson. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Councillor Emerson. Ennis. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Gittings. Yes, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Grassoff. Good evening, Mr. Uh -huh. Mayor. Good evening. Councillor Hacker. Present, Mr. Mayor. Yes, oh, good, good. Councillor Hoskin. Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, Councillor James. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Jones. Yes, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Khan. Yes, Mr. Mayor, please. <laughs> good evening. Councillor Leng. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Lovelock. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councillor Mangini. I saw her face earlier. Councillor Mangini. 
Yes, I'm here. Councillor Muskell. Mr Mayor, I am present. Thank you. Councillor McEwen. Yes, Mr Mayor. Councillor McGonagall. Yes, Mr Mayor. Councillor McGenna. Oh, sorry again, Councillor McKenna. He's just joined. Councillor McKenna. Yes, Mr Mayor. He's just walked through the door, says somebody. OK, I'll come back to him. Councillor O'Connell. Yes, Mr Mayor. Councillor Page. Councillor Page. OK, so well, I might come back to him as well. Councillor um, Pierce. Yes, Mr Mayor. Councillor Robinson. Good evening. Yes, Mr Mayor. Good evening, Councillor Robinson. Councillor Rowland. Yes, Mr Mayor. Uh, Councillor Rin. Yes, Mr Mayor. Uh, um, Councillor Diapal Singh. Councillor Diapal Singh. Councillor Raj Singh. Present, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Skeets has sent her apologies. Councillor Sakali. Yes, Mr Mayor. And Councillor Stamford Beal. Yes, Mr Mayor. Councillor Terry. Yes, Mr Mayor. Councillor White. Councillor White. Yes, Mr Mayor. Very good. Councillor Whittam. Yes, Mr Mayor. Uh, Councillor Josh Williams. Yes, Mr Mayor. And Councillor Rose Williams. Yes, Mr Mayor. And finally, Councillor Woodward. Good evening, Mr Mayor. Uh, good evening, Councillor Woodward. So I think a couple we didn't get earlier. Councillor McKenna. Do we have you? He's just logging on, Mr Mayor. OK, so we hopefully have him later. And I think Diapal Singh was the only other one. We've only lost a few on the school trip, Mr Mayor. <laughs> yes, that's a good effort really for a start, isn't it? All right, well, we'll, we'll get started and hopefully they'll be with us and uh, if not, we'll, we'll cope. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I'd like to also introduce you to the officers who are in attendance tonight. And they'll not be seen on screen as much as the councillors, but it's right that I introduce them so you'll know who they are and what their role is. So first up is uh, Mr Sloman, Peter Sloman, who's the council's chief executive. Um, Mike Graham. Mike Graham is the councillor's monitoring officer. Michael Popham is from committee services section. He'll be taking the minutes this evening. OK, item two, which is declarations of interest. I've not been notified of any declarations of interest to be declared. Uh, declared. I'll now pause for a moment to allow any councillor to state if they have an interest they wish to declare the nature of the um, during the evening and also the nature of the interest. So I assume that from that, no indications. Therefore, we'll proceed to the next item business, the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, item three. So councillors, could you please confirm the minutes are a correct record of the meeting that we held on the 20th of October 2020? Just un unmute and say agreed, please. Agreed. 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 So we have three. Thank you, councillors. Minutes agreed. were approved and I'll sign agreed. the course. <laughs> agreed. Uh, uh, Spirits are running high again. Um, so item four, um, petitions. Um, I've not received any petitions for this evening's meeting, so we'll move on to uh, questions. Item five, um, questions for members of the public. Um, and unusually on this occasion, I've not received any questions for this evening's meeting from members of the public. So that takes us then to, what well, it's listed here as item seven, it must be item six. So item six, which is um, count, uh, questions from councillors. So the first question is from Councillor Ennis on the return <coughs> to schools during the current pandemic. So Councillor Ennis, I'd like to ask your question. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Could the lead councillor for education please give an update on how the return to schools has gone so far this year during the current pandemic? And Councillor Pierce, I think you're going to uh, respond. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I thank Councillor Ennis for the question and a chance to give an update on the return of schooling after the Christmas break. I'd firstly like to cover a little bit of the history here. Before Christmas, with cases of COVID rising rapidly in many areas, some schools requested a switch to remote learning for the last few days of term to keep staff safe and cases as low as possible. The government refused these requests and even threatened schools with legal actions if they did shut. Over the Christmas holidays, a period where school staff should be resting, relaxing and not working, 
The government released further guidance on many different things which heads and staff dutifully read and acted upon. One of these was the mass testing in secondary schools where, where staff or volunteers needed to be recruited, risk assessment changed and logistics worked out because at this stage exam groups were to be back in classrooms on January the 11th and all secondary school pupils would be back on January the 18th. Primary pupils were to be back in from January the 4th. With pressure mounting on the government from teaching unions, parents and head teachers, the Prime Minister went on TV on the 3rd of January and said, schools are safe. It is very, very important to stress that. School staff continued with their lesson planning and preparation for in-person lessons on Monday, January the 4th. As a council and as a party, we have backed the judgment and knowledge of our head teachers here in Reading throughout this pandemic and said we would support the decision of our head teachers to decide how they would open on that Monday, fully or partially. In the end, a number of our schools decided it was safest to open only partially on that Monday. Miraculously, and with seemingly new information that has not been shared with the public, the Prime Minister then went on national TV 8pm on Monday, January the 4th, to let us know there would be a national lockdown and schools would be open only to vulnerable children and those of key workers. The disregard that the government demonstrated for school staff and for the greater spread of the virus amongst households on that day should not be forgotten. Since the decision to partially close schools, a whole new raft of issues has arisen. In Reading, the in-school attendance varies from school to school, as you would expect, but we've seen around 9% of pupils in our primary schools on average and around 12% in our secondary schools on average. Clearly, many others are logging on remotely. The government's changing of the definition of vulnerable still needs to be much clearer for this lockdown to have the full effect in stopping the spread of the virus. With the delay in the physical return of most secondary school pupils, mass testing preparation had a little more time. Although at the time of writing, this is in doubt. Here in Reading, one of our secondary schools took part in a pilot scheme where the Department for Education and other local schools could learn lessons on how a system could be run. With many pupils at home and learning remotely, the issue of free school meals arose again, with images of inadequate food parcels being shared online. Last year, before the national scheme came in, we had already set up a locally run voucher scheme and called for the return of these so that parents could make the right choice for their children. The government have since U-turned on this. Summer exams were cancelled by Gavin Williamson and a consultation set up to determine how grades would be allocated in the summer. There was no plan B ready for ready and schools, parents and pupils are still in limbo. The consultation opened last week, uh, last week where the main component seems to be that students will still have to sit some form of exam. I spoke at a governor's briefing in October last year to discuss options that could have been taken up. Last week, Gavin Williamson said teachers would be top priority for vaccines. Whilst this is welcome, more detail and assurance is needed. Myself and others locally, including Reading East MP Matt Rodder, have spoken out in support of this for some time. The government made big noises about more laptops for disadvantaged students, something we all know is a major requirement to help close the disadvantage gap. Last week, the Sutton Trust called this ineffective and that the picture has barely changed since the scheme was introduced. In Reading, we have distributed over 650 laptops, but we would like more and we, we've received many generous donations from local individuals and businesses that we are coordinating. The government's handling of school closures and reopening has been woeful from start to finish. They've not listened to the voices of heads, teaching unions, parents, governors, pupils or local authorities. At every step, local knowledge and action has outshone anything done nationally. But the real story here are our teachers and school leaders. It is they that have picked up the slack, picked up the pieces, adapted, prepared, filled in the gaps that this government refuses to do. They've worked tirelessly and in the terms of this government, thanklessly. But it is not thankless from us. I'll never tire of praising the work all of our school staff throughout the last year and will do so again. Thank you and you deserve so much more from this government. Um, thank you, Councillor Pearce. I think um, you have a supplementary, Councillor Ness. Yeah, we do. Um, can the lead councillor please give an update on the nursery funding, um, if that's possible? Yeah, th thanks, Councillor Ness. Uh, we, we had a bit of hope last week when one of the, the head teachers unions uh, put, put something out saying that there was a, a line in a DfE um, email that said they might be looking at this, but uh, they appear to have, have not budged. So we've our maintained nurseries, uh, which are run by the council, of which we've got five here in Reading, uh, all rated outstanding, outstanding by Ofsted. Uh, it's well known that 
maintain nurseries are one of the best ways of closing the dis disadvantage uh, gap. Uh, their funding is based on the number of pupils in on a particular day, the census day. Uh, that was last Thursday. Uh, we, we haven't got the full figures back yet, but we would expect with home working, uh, you know, fears over, over COVID uh, and partial closures that the numbers would be a lot lower than usual. At the moment, the government appear not to be budging and saying that the funding will be based on that day. Um, we would like to see the, the nurseries be funded with the numbers that would usually be in from the previous year. Um, and if they are funded the way the government is proposing at the moment, they simply would not be able to cope. So I would urge the government of which um, I know Reading West MP Alok Sharma is a member to urgently and very seriously look at the issue of nursery funding in the coming days. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we'll move on to question two. Um, that's going to be asked by Councillor McGonagall. Councillor McGonagall. Thank you. Um, uh, as a Green Party councillor, I have written to Reading's at two MPs expressing my support for this bill, which is the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill which calls on all countries to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Real and urgent action is needed to achieve this and time is running out. 2050 will be far too late. Will the leader of the council join me and will he urge group leaders to do the same in order that our MPs know that when it comes to the climate emergency, we are standing up for social and environmental justice. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gogol. And your question is going to be answered by Councillor Brock. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and I thank Councillor McGonigal for her question. I note that the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill is a presentation bill, which is a type of private members bill that requires no parliamentary debate or vote, and which as a result has very little, well, effectively no chance of becoming law. While I support many of the sentiments behind the bill, our current focus is on delivering the existing very challenging commitments, which we recently signed up to in the new Reading Climate Emergency Strategy. I can assure Councillor McGonigal, however, that this administration shares her desire for more urgent and effective government action on climate change. And to this end, the Chief Executive recently wrote to Alok Sharma MP and other senior ministers calling for a higher level of more sustained financial support for our efforts to tackle emissions in areas such as housing retrofit, transport and renewable energy, which we have identified as priorities, but which require a level of investment beyond our means locally. Uh, we believe at this stage that meaningful government funding to help deliver these commitments would be of greater value than draft legislation which offers no guarantee that the resources required will be forthcoming. We will therefore continue to lobby for that investment in our ongoing communication with local MPs and government, as well as pressing on with our own programme of low carbon investment via our capital programme. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Brock. Um, Councillor McGonagall, do you have a supplementary? No, thank you. OK, so we'll move on then to the third question and Councillor White, you're going to ask about rough sleeping in Reading. Councillor White. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yeah, this question is on rough sleeping in Reading. In 2020, the council did a great job of housing the overwhelming majority of rough sleepers during the initial lockdown. Please can the lead councillor update me with the monthly head count of our rough sleepers for each month in 2020. Can the lead councillor also update me on progress with permanently housing the rough sleepers who were temporarily housed in 2020? Thank you, Councillor White. And then Councillor Ennis, you're going to respond, I think. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor White, for your um, question. Between March and August 2020, the Reading Housing Needs Teams accommodated 264 individuals through the Everyone In initiative. 
of those that were placed under everyone in, currently there are 55 individuals still accommodated in this COVID-19 emergency accommodation, with a further 10 in Reading Borough Council temporary accommodation. 26 of those in emergency accommodation are EEA or third country nationals without recourse to public funds. Since December 2020, an additional 35 individuals have been accommodated in emergency winter provision accommodation, with 28 people using it at a point of writing. 129 individuals to date have been moved into settled accommodation, with 46 into private rented settled accommodation and 38 into <coughs> supported accommodation. During January 2021, there has been between two to six people sleeping rough on any night. Apart from a small number who are offered accommodation, these are known individuals who either have accommodation available, but are temporarily not using it or are refusing to engage with any offer of accommodation. Our outreach services continue to work with them to encourage them to accept or use the offer of accommodation. The figures below in the bar chart provide a snapshot of people found sleeping rough on the dates indicated. It is worth noting that they fluctuated heavily over the course of the everyone in period. Those individuals reported in that period that did not already have accommodation available will have been provided an offer of emergency housing and it's got figures and dates. Um, on January, on the 8th of January 2021, the government provided renewed advice and guidance for local authorities in respect of COVID-19 and people found rough sleeping. The guidance required local authorities to ensure that everyone found rough sleeping is made an offer of safe and appropriate accommodation and that steps are taken to ensure that their health needs are assessed and that they are registered with a GP. The service continues to support those found sleeping rough through commissioned accommodation based and outreach support services and additionally through cold weather plans winter provision provision which are in place until the end of March, making offers of accommodation to all verified rough sleepers, including those with no recourse to public funds. Heading over move on accommodation. The council has invested heavily in the provision of move on accommodation for rough sleepers with an innovative 10 bed women only project opening this month and the development of 40 modular constructed homes at the cattle market site due to be completed in the spring. As a result of a successful bid for next steps accommodation funding to the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Governments, both accommodation projects will have 24 hour intensive support provision to help the residents to rebuild their lives. And the heading of health the NHS Housing Outreach Liaison Team, HALT, has been working with people found sleeping rough since the beginning of the pandemic to assess their clinical needs and to arrange registration with a GP. A GP practice was identified by Health to accept the registration of individuals in this provision. The HALT nurses and St Mungo's, our commissioned outreach service, continue to prioritise this as an action for all individuals, although it can be challenging due to the chaotic nature of some of the clients. Housing Services is working with public health in collating client numbers and frontline staff numbers working with this cohort so they can be factored into local area action plans in line with the JCVI advice on COVID vaccination prioritisation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Um, Councillor White, do you have a supplementary? Yes, please, I Mr Mayor. 
thanks for the answer, Councillor Ennis, and thanks to the hard work of everyone in the housing and related teams. Uh, uh, and in the answer, the figures given for the rough sleeping headcount are particularly interesting, I thought, and it's worrying that the annual headcount has, has gone up to 19, considering that uh, most of the rough sleepers were, were housed at, at one point earlier in the year. So I'd like Councillor Ennis to clarify if he expects the measures mentioned, which are in the pipeline, such as the modular homes, uh, which I support, to bring the annual headcount down from 19 in 2021. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for your question. Sorry there, Mr. Mayor. Thanks You're for your sure. question. It's not a matter. I've, I've explained to Councillor White. And thank you for your positive question, by the way. But I've explained to you it's not a math mathematical equation that we have that amount of accommodation equals or plus that amount of individuals on the street equals a lower headcount. Individuals are sleeping rough for a variety of reasons, which I hope has encapsulated into the question you know, the issues of health, mental health, substance misuse. And to give an example how difficult this situation is and how I think that housing have done particularly well to ensure that nobody um, who wants to should be sleeping on the streets of Reading. There was a story about a well-known hotel, which a lot of people like to stay at, was offered to two individuals. A, I think it's a five-star hotel. Um, and the two individuals had rooms there. Uh, were brought in from from the cold, from rough sleeping. The individuals chose to go back out into the streets rather than stay at that hotel because obviously issues of mental health and substance misuse and the lifestyle that they wanted to lead um, was better for them out in the streets than it would be in a reputable hotel. That's the difficulty we face, mm. um, you know, working with people. But rest assured, we will be getting the head count down to as minimum as possible to zero would be the intention and we got the resources to do so. We just got to hopefully motivate and work with the clients to get them to see sense and come off the streets into accommodation. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Councillor Ennis. Um, so that come, brings us to the end of councillors' questions. So then we move on to item seven, which is the approval of the local council tax support scheme and the council tax base for the year 21-22. And I think uh, Councillor Emberson is going to introduce, introduce this item. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I do move this item. Um, this report tracks annually to council and is quite a perfunctory item that uh, a lot of members don't normally speak on, but I think it's worth reflecting this year at least that it goes without saying that we are in unprecedented times and indeed the report at 1.3 reflects the impact of COVID on the council tax base and I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the revenue and benefits team who continue to work with uh, council taxpayers in a compassionate manner for those that are struggling in the current times yet we continue to see a steady collection rate ensuring that we are able to um, work as a council and run the services that this town needs and I'm really grateful to all the staff for doing that and not only are they able to work on the council tax but they've made sure that a lot of grants have got to small businesses, the self-employed in this difficult time and these are uncertain times and indeed the budget will be tracking to council at the next meeting and I'd just like to put my thanks on record to all the staff that continue to support people and I therefore support the recommended action, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Emerson. So I've got a couple of people who have indicated that they'd like to speak. Um, so first of all, seconder. Do we have a seconder? I think we do. Mr. Mayor, can I second and reserve my right? Uh, absolutely, I thought you would. So we have um, Councillor Brock to second, and the first speaker is going to be Councillor White. Councillor White. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the Green councillors will be supporting the recommended action. Uh, we are glad that the council's ta council tax support scheme isn't being made harder to access as it has been in some years. We think times are tough for many people at the moment and Reading Council definitely shouldn't be making things tougher, uh, which it isn't on, on this occasion. So we will be supporting the recommended action. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor White. Councillor Stamford-Beale. 
Thank you, Mr Mayor. The, the Conservative group will be supporting this tonight. Um, as Councillor Emberson said, uh, we would like to note the, the hard work of, of all the council services during the pandemic, in particular the Revs and Benefits team who've done so well, um, and also um, our public health team who've helped to keep as much as many services going as possible and keep as many staff and residents safe um, as possible during the pandemic. Um, it is to note that um, uh, you know people can apply for um, council tax support um, and we do know that um, during the pandemic the government did in introduce the furlough scheme, completely unprecedented scheme for this country, to try to give people who weren't able to work um, the opportunity to have income. So I, th I think we do need to point that one out as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Stamford Beale. Um, so, Councillor Brock, would you like to speak now? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Just to briefly say, uh, please, that we've got cross party support uh, to echo the sentiments expressed by Councillor Emberson, Councillor White, and Councillor Stanford Beale that uh, we do owe a debt of gratitude to the team in, in the uh, revenues and benefits uh, department because they have done absolutely outstanding work and they've done outstanding work with residents and businesses across the town and I'm sure they will continue to do so and it's been uh, greatly pleasing to me actually to have had so much positive feedback over recent months um, from residents and from businesses who have had for one reason or another to proactively get in touch with that team so really pleased with what's going on there but that's all from me happy to second as as printed Mr Mayor. Thank you Councillor Brock and then Councillor Emerson would like to just sum up Nothing further to add, Mr Mayor. Um, support the recommended action and I'm grateful for the cross-party support. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I didn't get any sense of any um, uh, dissent from that. So if we're happy, we will vote by acclamation, in which case, um, if everybody's happy to say four, please unmute your mics and uh, say four now. Four. 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 Super. Four. Thank you very much. So, four now. So, I think I even I even heard Councillor Devine in there. I think this I, I'm sure he was. So, oh. um, so the, clearly the motion is carried. And also delighted to report that Councillor Page has finally crashed his way through the door and has now joined us. So that's good. All right. Yeah, so we apologies, Mayor. Uh, the internet defeats everybody occasionally. We could we could hear you hammering on the door outside, Councillor Page. I'm glad, glad you're now in. Um, so we get to item eight, um, which is around about um, uh, the first and only motion of the evening um, regarding union learning funds. And I think Councillor Leng is going to propose the motion. Councillor Leng. Yeah, hello. Thank you, Minister Mayor, fellow councillors. The Union Learning Fund was established in 1998 to help create. To help to help create a learning society. The need for this kind of approach has very much increased since the late 1990s. Since, since this government promised to put training and reskilling at the centre of its economic levelling up plans, therefore their, their intention to scrap the, the Union Learning Fund is short-sighted and will prove to be counterproductive. The Union Learning Fund has been one of the most successful adult learning initiatives, expanding the capacity of trade unions to provide learning reps in workplaces. These reps provide advice and support both union members and non-members, offering workers opportunities to upskill and train. Union learning reps are especially good at engaging workers who would otherwise fall through the gaps left by more traditional learning methods. The positive outcomes of the Le Union Learning Fund have been felt by both workers and employers countrywide. Union Learn has established that for every pound that is invested in the Union Learning Fund, a return of £12.30 is generated. This consists of an economic return of £7.60 to the employee and £4.70 to the employer. In addition, the University of Leeds and the University of Exeter have reported that over three quarters of employers report a beneficial return on their investment in Union Learning. Union Learning makes an estimated contribution to the UK economy of £1.45 billion. The estimated return to the Exchequer is £3.57 for each £1 invested. Finally, and most importantly, the majority of learners would not have undertaken the learning without the support of the union. 
In the face of such evidence, how can this government justify a cut? Oh, we lost you, Councillor Lane. Lost me. No. Mm. Um, so what's happened? I've we've still got you, Mr. Mayor. You've got me, have we you? We can so still not... hear you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So it's not me. I was being I was on my own here. Great. So it looks like we've lost Councillor Lang. Um, Mr. We'll... Mayor, it's uh, Mike Graham here. I, yep. I, I I imagine that we've had enough of the speech for it to be formally uh, formally moved, if you like. If we don't um, uh, get Councillor Lang back, perhaps the seconder could. Um, could speak and uh, you carry on. Exactly. Thank you for that. I was heading that right direction. Very good. So just wish it wasn't just me. So we, we've obviously have seen the, um, the the motion in writing and members of the public can also see it um, on the website. Um, so in that case, we'll assume that the motion has been moved and then Councillor Hacker, I believe that you would like to second the motion. Yes, I'm seconding and reserving my right. Super. OK, thank you very much. So I've got a number of speakers have indicated, so um, we won't hurry you along, but obviously if you can make your points fairly clearly and uh, concisely, that'll be really helpful for the rest of us. So the first up is Councillor Josh Williams. Thank Councilor you, Mr. Josh Mayor. Williams. Yep, yep. Um, um, can you hear me OK? I can. Yep, I can hear you. Perfect. Um, I, I guess I was uh, I would have been interested to hear uh, everything that Councillor Leng had to say, so I'm sorry for that. Um, but it's lovely to virtually see everyone uh, this evening. Um, and, and thank you to Councillor Leng, even if the Internet has let him down um, for playing this motion before us. Green councillors uh, will be happy to support it, uh, Chair. Um, we think politicians should listen to the unions on this issue, and I hope our MPs are also listening, uh, both of them uh, tonight. With the continued uh, rise of corporate giants during the pandemic and the news from America today that I read that some companies are deliberately using the pandemic to attack the unions in that country, I think we all need to be mindful of how important to our communities our unions are. I'm sure uh, Councillor Hacker will speak on that a bit as well. Um, we should listen to the unions. I know in the past that Unison have been critical of Reading Borough Council for blocking equal pay claims, saying the council's actions were nothing short of immoral. And GM, the GMB have accused councillors of huge scale privatisation and Unite the Union says that we should take back control of our leisure, our gyms, our swimming pools and stop the obsession with outsourcing. So I think we should listen to the unions on a whole range of issues and we're very happy to support this motion, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Very superly concise. Well done. Um, Councillor Simon Robinson. Councillor Robinson. You? Okay, well, I can't hear Councillor Robinson. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, right, yes. so it's sort of yes. reassuring again that I'm not sitting here talking to myself. OK, well, if we can't get Councillor Robinson, um, let's go to the next one. It's Councillor Hoskin. Come back to Councillor Robinson in a minute. Councillor Hoskin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And uh, yeah, fingers crossed that my wi -Fi holds. Um, <laughs> well, uh, following on from Councillor Williams, Councillor Williams uh, once accused me uh, when we were actually in a council chamber of being a Blairite. And, whilst I uh, was uh, advised that uh, slander laws would be no good to me. Um, I think it's worth telling everyone actually in, in, in real effect, my uh, background in politics and my values and much of uh, what I hopefully bring to this, uh, uh, this council is rooted in my uh, long time as a trade union activist uh, and actually a shop senior shop steward uh, in Reading. And it's on that, um, experience and uh, in day to day uh, working with the Union Learning Fund that I urge everyone to uh, support this this motion. Um, there's a really good I won't go over, I won't repeat a lot of the stuff that's in the motion as you read the motion it tells you pretty much everything you need to know. It's worth saying that I mean of all the things to attack the Union Learning Fund is one of the great successes of British uh, government that 
parties across the political spectrum and until this uh, point the Conservative uh, government have, have supported and have acknowledged the success. At the moment we've got you know major employers like Tesco's, Arla Foods, Tata Steel um, are supporting the TUC campaign to retain the Union Learning Fund because it is an immense success. You know, it ranges uh, in terms of supporting uh, people in terms of literacy, numeracy skills, IT, um, uh, English, vocational, you know, professional development. But what it also does is it helps to um, engage and support those who are perhaps least of likely to have uh, been engaged in lifelong learning in the past, really getting to, to people who um, could be left behind in terms of development. and. This country, I think we can all acknowledge, this is you know, fact, faces a huge productivity problem. Productivity in British industry and in the British economy has been declining considerably uh, over, um, over the past decade. Um, and the Union Learning Fund is one of those um, success stories. It's a, it's a 12 million pound fund. Um, Councillor Lane was giving us some really good statistics. I mean, it's estimated that it delivers a net contribution of more than 1.4 billion pound as a result of its boost to jobs, wages and productivity. You know, that is something we don't want to lose at this time. Furthermore, this is about, you know, this is about the human uh, scale. This is about people in workforces who can access support and learning and actually and I've seen this in front of my own eyes and if you you know have a look on the internet in terms of um, discussion on the Union Learning Fund and some of the uh, academic analysis of its success it transforms people's lives it transforms lives and one of the I haven't got the statistic here one of the most important statistics is the the percentage of people who gain a qualification for the Union, Union Learning Fund who had no previous qualifications who get on the ladder of learning and upskilling. I don't know what the government's motivation for uh, acting this fund is. I can only think it's there can be no political reason. It's a popular, uh, it's a popular uh, initiative. It's popular with employers. It's popular with trade unions. It's popular with workers. It's popular with managers. It's popular with the HR industry. The only place it might not be popular might be a hardcore of anti-trade union conservatives that may be uh, being thrown a bone. I urge. Alok Sharma as our local M one, well, my MP, to uh, listen to this council, where hopefully um, in support of this motion, in rethinking support for axing this valuable, valuable fund. Um, I've seen my own eyes the great good it does for the people of Reading, and I urge you all to vote and support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hoskin. Um, so let's try and go again back for the second time asking to Councillor Solomon Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think I was hit by the same problem that uh, Councillor Leng had in terms of my internet connection went completely off. Um, Mr. Mayor, fellow councillors, firstly, I'd like to thank Councillor Leng for bringing this motion to full council. The government's decision to end the funding of the Union Learning Fund wasn't an easy decision to make, as we all acknowledge that the ULF has done a great job over the many years it has existed in encouraging and providing advice and guidance to workplace learners. As we know, the fund itself does not pay for training itself, but its aim was to develop the capacity of trade unions and union learning representatives to work with employers, employees and learning providers to encourage greater take up of learning in the workplace. Since 1998, when this fund was started, a great deal has changed in the world of workplace learning. Applications like learning management systems and latterly learning experience platforms have revolutionized the way learners in the workplace find access and book on learning and skills training using a mix of variables such as interests, recommendations, historic learning data and AI to provide automated personalized learning paths to update skill sets, skill sets to help the learner progress in their career or to move to another career path altogether, thus reducing heavy administration overheads. But it's not only the way learning and develop development is managed and, and administered that has changed the rise in popularity and uptake amongst companies and organizations of easily accessible training through e-learning, gamification-based learning and virtual classroom events has transformed workplace learning from the way it was when the fund was first set up and has led to a significant reduction in the cost of training compared to the traditional classroom-based model that used to be the norm. 
12 million per year for administration to manage learners, advertise learning interventions and provide for booking on courses may have been cost effective 20 years ago, but with advances in technology and learning development working practices, a great deal of the administration can now be handled much more efficiently through automation. Accusations have also been levelled at the government as to the timing of this change in that we are in the midst of a devastating pandemic with many facing job losses and needing to be reskilled. The government fully realises and recognises the desperate need to upskill and reskill facing the workforce and has committed a 2.5 billion national skills fund programme to address this. The national skills fund is a substantial commitment to invest 2.5 billion in skills development over this parliament, which compares to 12 million in the current annual budget for Union Learn. As you may know, there's an existing adult entitlement to support any adult without English and Maths Level 2 or Digital Skills Level 1 to gain those qualifications. And now the Prime Minister has also confirmed a new lifetime learning guarantee that any adult without a Level 3 qualification would be fully funded to obtain one. Reinvesting our existing funding for Union Learn in our expanded offer will contribute to a much more comprehensive offer in future, accessible to a, wide, a far wider range of learners in the workplace, helping them to develop their skills and careers. It is also uh, worth noting that no ongoing commitment to fund the ULF in perpetuity was ever made. In closing, I would remark that the sum of 12 million per year is not so high as to be beyond the possibility of the trade unions funding this themselves if they so wished. It is deniably true, it is undeniably true, that many trade unions are considerably wealthy and unite as an example, having reported assets of over a quarter of a billion. Perhaps if the will for the TUC and the trade unions to continue this fund is so strong, then self-funding could be the solution. Given the reasons mentioned and the substantial increase and improvements in workplace learning and skills funding, we will not be supporting this motion this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Robertson, thank you for that. Um, two more speakers and then Councillor Hector sort of to second, so I'll take them in this order. Um, can I have Councillor Daveen first and then we'll follow Councillor Carmel. So Councillor Ricky Daveen. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, well, we will be supporting this motion. Uh, we too um, find it strange that the, the government is actually taking action against the ULF, uh, given it, its success story as detailed in the motion. And my only really question is why we've had to wait since the letter received from the DfE in October until now to have this subject brought before us. Um, nevertheless, we will be supporting uh, the motion this evening. Thank you very much, Councillor Devine. Very short and sweet. Um, so then, Councillor Carnell, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Ling, for bringing this motion to Council. We don't yet know how quickly nor in what direction the economy will recover after COVID, and nor do we know where the road to post-Brexit prosperity will take us. We can reasonably assume it will take us to new places and employment will be very different to what we see today. We know of the government commitment to a greener economy, the commitment to electric cars being just one example. As these old technologies are replaced by new, old skills will evolve, uh, re disappear and change and adapt to new skills and practices. New job, new job opportunities will emerge. Uh, the pace of change will continue pace and lifetime learning will be the new normal in a way those only a generation before us would find unbelievable. I'm fully supportive of lifetime learning. Personally, about 20 years ago, I retrained as I saw how this country's manufacturing base was being decimated by the then Labour government. Fortunately, I was in a position to self-fund this career change, and many people are not so fortunate. And for that reason, I will not be supporting this motion. The £12 million Union Learning Fund was never established to run in perpetuity. It doesn't fund a single course buy a single textbook or pay a single tutor. All it pays for is administration and union officials to offer advice. As uh, we heard from my friend, Councillor Robinson, one wonders if the TUC, if they find the scheme so attractive, 
why they don't fund it from themselves or with support from their affiliated members. The £12 million is just a small part of a now much larger package totalling £2.5 billion over the course of this Parliament, funding apprenticeships and training. A skills toolkit offering 70 courses uh, as diverse as digital skills, adult numeracy and literacy, employability and work readiness skills. The skills most sought by employers. Skills which will help people stay employed and seek new opportunities and openings. And it isn't just the government's role to provide lifetime learning. Employers are upskilling staff at previously unseen levels. Employers now recognise the value of improving the skill set of their employers. And I hope that as an employer, we at Reading Borough Council are fully signed up for lifetime learning, not guided by a union official, but by what is best for the employee and the community we all serve. Uh, with new skills, employees are not just better educated, but better motivated. And I believe there are better ways than the Union Learning Fund to uh, support lifetime learning. And I won't be supporting this motion. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Carnell. So in that case, could I ask Councillor Packer if she'd like to um, second the motion, please? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. I, I certainly would like to second the motion. Uh, first of all, I'd like to obviously declare that I am a, a long line trade unionist and also I was trained as a lifelong learning rep. I think learning is an extremely important thing to do throughout your life, whether it's for pleasure or for changing career. Something I also did 18 months ago was change my career. And I must admit that the skills I was given through the Union Learning Fund and the, um, the learning through my Union Unite meant I could make that change. Unfortunately, my employer at the time didn't provide all this amazing upskilling and amazing courses that um, Councillor Robinson and Councillor Carnell mentioned. They'd give you the very basics to do your job, but anything above that just simply wasn't available. I find it very interesting to, to hear that Councillor Robinson saying that the decision wasn't easy, and it turns out the decision was neither popular with employers or trade unions or members of the public. So you kind of start to wonder why it is that the government has decided to scrap the union learning fund. Hmm, let me think. There's a word in there that might give us a clue. 1.72 million people are currently unemployed in this country, and they estimate that by the beginning, middle of next year, it will be 2.6 million people unemployed. We need a skilled workforce to ensure this country recovers from the difficult financial situation the pandemic has put us in. And that skilled workforce aren't going to appear from nowhere. These skilled people are already in our workplaces, but are going to have to adapt to the things they do to fit, to fit the jobs of the future. And they are doing this already through the Union Learning Fund. They may take on skills that mean they do their job better, more productively and more efficiently, or they may, like me, decide to change career entirely and do something different, which again contributes to the economy. So we go back to the reason why the government are deciding to scrap this. As, Council as Councillor Carnell said, it's a small part of a larger funding pot available for learning. So let's have a think. So the government say they're going to put a new replacement in place. But why do that when the existing learning fund is working so well, is such high quality and is such excellent value for money? Why scrap it when you get such value for money that for every you get £12.30 for every £1 spent by the fund? And why scrap it when keep, it's keeping our workforce in place? But let's think about it. The people who access the union learning fund are unionised workforces and the government and councillors Robinson and Carnell we're quick to criticise trade unions and we need trade unions more now than we ever have to ensure that our workforces are safe. So let's get to the very crux of this. The government are deciding to scrap this trade union learning fund simply because it's the trade unions who are using it and it's the trade unionists and those who are in unionised workplaces that are accessing it and skilling themselves up and becoming more powerful and more um, skilled in the economy. So this is clearly a political attack I think it's absolutely disgraceful that such a, as Councillor Carnell said, small part or small pot of money is being scrapped for the sake of an ideological attack on our trade unions, our trade unionised workplaces and every single trade union member. So I support Councillor Lane's um, motion. It's a fantastic motion and I hope to see the Trade Union <coughs> Learning Fund continue well into the future, ensuring that our workforces are skilled and can change and adapt to the changing nature of employment as we go forward into the 21st century. I second. Thank you very much, Councillor Hacker. 
Um, let's try and go back to Councillor Lang because sadly he was such cut short when he was uh, proposing the motion. So let's have another go to see if he can uh, sum up for us. Still not here with us, Councillor Lang. OK, sadly, it seems that we've lost him. Um, so hopefully we've had speakers from all four groups. And so from that, we can deduce how people wish to vote. And I think it's fair then to say that we can do it by vote by acclamation. So what I'll do is I'll um, ask you to unmute now all of everybody. And if all those that are vote for, can you say please vote for now? Anybody, any group oh, wish to oh, vote against, oh, vote against now? Against. 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 against, against. Thank against. you very much. So we know which, which has voted against. Now, and for, for fairness, um, is there any anybody wishes to express any dissent from their, their uh, group position, please speak now. OK, so um, for the record, we can assume that councillors have a group um, voted with their groups and therefore um, I think uh, Mr Popham can actually deduce the numbers from that. So with that, I think that was our one motion for the evening and that was also the last item. Um, so we've successfully got to the end of our, our second full council meeting by um, by sort of conference over, over the internet. Um, thank you very much for everybody attending. Uh, all the speakers um, and hopefully one day we all will meet again in person um, and that concludes the, the business of the evening. Thank you very much. Good night everybody. Thank you Mr Mayor. 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 Thank you Mr Mayor